Good. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm chairing this session. My name is Guy Claxton. Uh, I'm a cognitive scientist of a particular stripe and an educational provocateur in my day job. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to the RSA for, uh, for today's lunchtime talk. Um, I'm told that I have to say, before we begin, uh, could you make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent? Make sure that mine is. Um, we're filming this session today uh, and live streaming over the web, so welcome also to all of those who, all of those who are watching online. And a reminder that if you want to be involved in the Twitter sphere, uh, the hashtag is hash RSA flourish. So please uh, don't feel you need to turn your phones off, but involve yourself in the conversation that I'm sure will start raging on the airwaves. Okay, housekeeping over. So uh, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce this afternoon's special guest speaker, Matthew Crawford. It's a particular pleasure and honor for me. Uh, I first came across Matt's work, as some of you will have done, I'm sure, uh, in his book, The Case for Working with Your Hands, which had a different title in the American edition. And I've had the pleasure of, of chatting with Matt uh, a couple of times in various bits of, of the world uh, in the years since that was published. Um, we share a conviction in the importance of the physical in shaping human identity and in thinking about the good life, I think, and also a concern about the extent to which the physical is in some areas, for example, in education, denigrated and in other areas of our society marginalized um, in favor of a much more intellectualized or digitalized approach to life. Matt describes himself as, and indeed is, a philosopher mechanic. Um, and I think, uh, and this is not just because I've got to know him a little bit, one of our most interesting and most important uh, public thinkers, public intellectuals. Very briefly, uh, his CV on completing his PhD in political philosophy from the University of Chicago, Matt served as a postdoctoral fellow on its Committee on Social Thought. Currently, a senior fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia. Uh, he also runs Shoko Moto, a, a downtown motorcycle repair shop. The case for working with your hands was hailed as a bit of a masterpiece of critical insight into contemporary education, work, and culture. The book reflected on the experience of building things, fixing things, and considering the important problem of how to live concretely in an ever more abstract world. He joins us today to introduce his new book, The World Beyond Your Head, which takes up some of the themes from the earlier book. Um, and addresses uh, what you might call our current crisis of attention, the way in which we are surrounded by loud calls on our attention and how we can and how we do respond to that and how we come, uh, I think Matthew will argue, how we come to be vulnerable to those calls, how we come to be relatively weak psychologically and mentally in the face of this bombardment of claims on our, in, on our uh, attention. Um, so how our, uh, the, the book is fascinating because it goes in many different directions and weaves together quite alarming and quite surprising different uh, strands of thought, but really focuses on how our enlightenment sense of self makes us, contribute to that vulnerability in the face of all these calls on our attention. Enough from me. Please join me in welcoming to the lectern Matthew Crawford. It's uh, a real honor to be introduced by Guy, who I think is one of your most provocative and insightful thinkers on, on education, so I commend his work to you. So, um, the idea to write this book uh, kind of crystallized one day. I was in the um, supermarket and I swiped my bank card to pay for my groceries. Uh, and so that you've got the little screen and you watch it intently while it prompts you to do the next step. So you confirm the amount, <clears throat> enter your PIN. 
Well, during those intervals, uh, I was shown advertisements on the little screen because some genius had figured out that a person in that situation is a captive audience. Mm -hmm. And the intervals themselves, I had previously just assumed it was you know, a function of the communication technology, now seem to be something more deliberately calibrated. These haltings now served somebody's interest. Uh, and you know, I started to see things like this everywhere. It seems like a new um, frontier of capitalism has been opened up by our self-appointed disruptors. Uh, when, where the point is to dig up and monetize every bit of private headspace. Now, of course, we've developed habits for trying to tune this out. Uh, you can insert earbuds or uh, bury your face in your own device. But if you ride the bus in uh, South Korea now, you have advertising squirted into your nose, essentially. There's a smell resembling that of Dunkin' Donuts coffee that's released into the bus's ventilation system at the same time that the Dunkin' Donuts jingle plays over the sound system. And all this occurs just as the bus is pulling up outside a Dunkin' Donuts. And the driver points out the fact, in case you somehow missed it at that point. <clears throat> there remain many areas for further progress. Uh, the homework, report cards, permission slips, and all those little communications that a teacher sends home with students are in many school districts still blank on the back. So here's a gross offense against the efficient use of space. But there's at least one forward-thinking school district in Massachusetts that now sells uh, advertising space on the backs of these slips of paper. <clears throat> I learned that from the Colbert Report. Any of you watch that? It's uh, he's a comedian. You almost have to be a comedian, I think, to wrap your head around certain developments in, in modern culture. Uh, I'm making my way through O'Hare Airport in Chicago and not feeling especially receptive to the message that's applied to the moving handrail on the escalator. It says, you're in charge in this endlessly recurring loop. I don't feel very in charge. It seems like every surface of public space is being auctioned off to private interests. And I think that's connected to a wider sense that politics has been captured by such interests. The very idea of a public seems to have been eroded. Finally, I get to my gate at the airport with an hour to kill, and I'm unable to escape the chattering of CNN. So if the TV is within view, I find it very hard not to look at it. The introduction of novelty into our field of view commands what the cognitive psychologists call an orienting response. So an animal turns its face and eyes to the new thing. It could be a python. So it's an important <laughs> evolutionary adaptation in a world of predators. But of course, a new thing typically appears about once every second on TV. The images on the screen jump out of the flow of experience and make a demand on us. In their presence, it's hard to, um, for example, rehearse a remembered conversation. Now, <clears throat> in that kind of situation, people often stare at their phones or open a novel, hoping uh, to tune out the piped-in chatter. In this battle of attentional technologies, um, what's lost, I think, is the kind of public space this required for a certain kind of sociability. A public space where people are not self-enclosed in the heightened way that happens when our minds are elsewhere than our bodies may feel rich with possibility for spontaneous encounters. Even if we don't converse with others, our mutual reticence is experienced as reticence if our attention is not otherwise bound up but is rather free to alight upon one another and linger, or not, because we ourselves are free to pay out our attention in deliberate measures. To be the object of someone's reticence is quite different from not being seen by them. We may have a vivid experience of having encountered another person, even if in silence. Such encounters are always ambiguous, um, and their need for interpretation 
gives rise to a train of imaginings that are often erotic. I think that's what makes cities exciting. Now, of course, um, you know, in that airport scene, you can simply shift in your seat and avert your gaze from the screens. But the fields of view that haven't been captured for commerce seem to be getting fewer and narrower. The ever more complete penetration of public spaces by attention-getting technologies exploits the orienting response in a way that preempts sociability, directing us away from one another and toward a manufactured reality, the content of which is determined from afar by private parties that have a material interest in doing so. In the main currents of psychological research, um, attention is treated as a resource. A person has only so much of it. But we don't yet have a political economy corresponding to this resource. And so I want to offer the concept of an attentional commons. <clears throat> There are some resources that we hold in common, such as the, the air we breathe and the water we drink. We take them for granted, but their uh, widespread availability makes everything else we do possible. <clears throat> and I think the absence of noise is a resource of just this sort. More precisely, the valuable thing that we take for granted is the condition of not being addressed. And just as clean air makes it possible to breathe, silence, in this broader sense, makes it possible to think. And that's no small thing. We give it up willingly when we're in the company of other people that we know, and when we open ourselves to serendipitous encounters with strangers. But to be addressed by mechanized means is an entirely different matter. <clears throat> the benefits of silence are off the books. They're not measured directly by gross domestic product, um, but surely contribute to creativity and innovation and things that economists do talk about. They don't show up explicitly in social statistics, such as <clears throat> level of educational achievement. Yet one consumes a great deal of silence in the course of becoming educated. Silence is now offered as a luxury good. So, um, in the business class lounge at Charles de Gaulle Airport, what you hear is the occasional tinkling of a spoon against China. It's really lovely. There's no ads on the walls that I saw. There were no TVs. And this silence is what makes it feel genuinely luxurious. Uh, you step inside, and there's these kind of airtight doors that whoosh shut behind you. And the difference is nearly tactile. It's like stepping out of hair cloth into satin. Uh, your brow unfurrows itself. Your neck muscles start to relax. And after 20 minutes, you no longer feel exhausted. And this sort of pervasive sense of being hassled lifts. Now, outside the lounge is the usual airport cacophony. So because we've allowed our attention to be monetized, if you want yours back, you're going to have to pay for it. As the commons gets appropriated, one solution for those who have the means is to leave the commons for private clubs such as the business class lounge. Now, when you consider that it's those in the business lounge who make the decisions that determine the character of the peon lounge, uh, we might start to see these things in a political light. To engage in playful, inventive thinking and possibly create wealth for yourself during those idle hours spent at an airport requires silence. <clears throat> but other people's minds over in the peon lounge or the bus can be treated as a resource, a standing reserve of purchasing power to be directed according to <clears throat> brilliant marketing ideas hatched by those enjoying silence in the, in the business lounge. Now, when some people treat the minds of other people as a resource, this is not creating wealth as the phrase has it. It's a transfer of wealth. The ever greater concentration of wealth in a shrinking elite <clears throat> surely has many uh, complex causes. But let's just throw one more into the mix for consideration, <clears throat> and that is uh, the ever more aggressive appropriations of the attentional commons that we've allowed to take place. 
I think this becomes especially pertinent in an era of big data when we find ourselves the objects of attention getting techniques that are not only pervasive but increasingly well targeted. There's a lot of talk about a right to privacy in our digital lives and um, I think the this is sort of conceptually murky idea that it, and that it needs to be supplemented with something like a, a right not to be addressed. Now this would apply not of course to people who would address me face to face but to those who never show their face and treat my mind as a resource to be harvested by mechanized means. But intrusive advertising I think is just the tip of a much larger uh, cultural iceberg. We're living through, uh, I think, a crisis of attention, it's fair to say, and it's now pretty widely remarked upon, usually in the context of some complaint about technology. But I want to get beneath um, the debate about technology and consider what I take to be the more fundamental issue that, uh, that's in play when we're, when we're talking about that stuff, and that is the question of how we understand the self and its relationship to the world beyond our heads. Uh, I think there's a widespread sense of mental fragmentation. You know, we experience this um, as a crisis of self-ownership, that our attention is not simply ours to direct as we will. But often there's nobody to blame but ourselves, um, as there are so many enticements that we willingly invite into our lives, whether it's candy crush or porn, and we find these no less disturbing than intrusive advertising as they, um, they crowd out other forms of engagement with our surroundings and with other people. So what's at stake, I think, is nothing less than the question of uh, whether one can maintain a coherent self. I mean, a self that's able to act according to settled purposes and ongoing projects rather than flitting about. Because attention is so fundamental to our mental lives, uh, this widely felt problem, I think, presents one of those really rare occasions when an entire society is compelled to ask once more a very fundamental question, and that is, what does it mean to be human? This question is often more tacit than fully articulated, but it seems to be in the air these days. In grappling with it, um, we understandably reach for ideals that lie close to hand in Western culture. And I think the most prominent of these is freedom. And this is fitting because it, um, we feel beset by external forces that appropriate our attention. And it is indeed our mental freedom uh, that's at stake. And so a political motto like, don't tread on me, comes easily to mind. But in parsing the problem this way, we quickly run into a difficulty. According to the prevailing notion of freedom, it manifests as preference satisfaction. So this is the language of economics. Preferences themselves are said to be beyond rational scrutiny. They express the authentic core of a self whose freedom is realized when there are no obstacles to its preference satisfying behavior. Discovering your true preferences requires maximizing the number of choices you face, which of course is precisely the condition that makes for maximum dissipation of one's energies. According to this mindset, those who present choices to us appear as handmaidens to our own freedom, or liberators. So in other words, the language of freedom, though it certainly has um, you know, very serious origins in the Enlightenment, has become the language of marketing. So no limits, as the credit card offer says, or you're in charge. <clears throat> of course, nobody takes the autonomy talk of marketing seriously, but trying to liberate oneself from all this liberation can induce a bit of cognitive dissonance, I think. Um, there doesn't seem to be any culturally respectable ground on which to take a stand against autonomy talk which is, uh, you can think of as a sly appropriation of our most cherished ideal. And on top of that, the effect of so much solicitude for our freedom 
and the ever more aggressive presentation of choices is to ratchet up the burden of self-regulation. Um, and it does seem like strategies for, for asceticism are having kind of a renaissance right now, which is a little strange. It's not an ideal we associate with consumer capitalism. It's, it's a more of a monastic ideal. But I think this is understandable as a response to our, our moment. <clears throat> But the question arises whether we're going to be able to self-regulate our way out of um, the mental fragmentation that I think has become a, a defining feature of contemporary life. The cognitive psychologists, once again, have figured out that self-regulation is a capacity that we have a finite amount of, just like attention. It's like a muscle, um, and it's one that's pretty easily exhausted. You can't do it all day, every day. And I think that uh, becomes a very interesting fact when our lives are saturated with manufactured experiences that have been designed around us precisely for the sake of capturing our attention. So in the book, I make an analogy uh, with fast food. And food engineers figured out some time ago how to create these hyper palatable foods like Cheetos by um, getting the balance of sugar and fat and salts just right. <clears throat> when we relate to the world through a screen of representations that tap into our hardwired susceptibility for certain kinds of stimulation, human experience has become a highly engineered and therefore manipulable thing. And the natural world may begin to seem bland and tasteless, kind of like broccoli compared to Cheetos. So uh, distractibility you could regard as the mental equivalent of obesity. So when all this is the case, I think self-control will only get us so far. It's indispensable at crucial moments. But the fuller remedy is rather to become absorbed in some worthy object that has intrinsic appeal. Um, one that elicits our active involvement uh, and provides a kind of source of positive energy. And uh, sometimes our, something like that, our, our mental energies are just kind of gathered to a point. And once that is underway, I think it feels more like abandon than self-control, more like surrender than liberation. The language of eroticism I think is better suited for parsing it than is the language of asceticism or the liberationist idiom of prickly self-assertion, though I've used that language myself earlier uh, in this talk. So therefore, uh, let me <laughs> offer something positive after all this gloomy diagnosis. Um, the word attention is based on a Latin root that means to stretch or make tense. External objects provide an attachment point for the mind. A sufficiently involving object that demands skillful engagement can pull us out of ourselves to join the world beyond our heads, not as passive consumers of manufactured experiences, but as people who um, act in the world. Skilled practices such as cooking an elaborate meal for an important occasion, playing sports, playing music with other people, building things, fixing things. Such practices establish ecologies of attention that can give coherence to our mental lives, however briefly. The perception of a skilled practitioner is tuned, in a sense, to the affordances for action that present themselves in the particular niche of skill that she inhabits. Her activity organizes her perception of the situation and uh, tends to dampen extraneous information. So thought and action become unimpeded by the proliferation of choices. When it goes really well, um, time itself seems to dilate and become something to savor. When that happens, the burden of self-regulation is greatly reduced. It's, it's like having a good meal to continue the, the eating metaphor. But here's the thing. These well-ordered ecologies of attention in which people do really impressive things 
I think our intention with the ideal of autonomy, which literally means giving a law to yourself, I think that idea is closely connected to the ideal of sincerity, which you might say is the notion that you yourself can be the source of the standards by which you judge yourself. The freedom and dignity of the modern self seem to demand radical independence from the surrounding world, a state of self-sufficiency. I think it's something like that is hovering in the background when we use words like uh, individuality and especially authenticity. We're supposed to live up to an image of existential heroism and become a self-made person rather than someone who merely replicates um, the society he lives in or the life and world of his parents. So anything that looks like fate is the opposite of autonomy. But such a fixation on the self isn't much in evidence when we look at people absorbed in the kind of skilled practices in which individual creativity actually manifests. So in the book, I present these case studies of um, short order cooks, hockey players, jazz musicians, um, uh, scientific communities, uh, and people who build um, Baroque pipe organs as it happens. In all of these pursuits, people are doing things, and what they do is not simply determined by their own will in glorious isolation. Rather, they achieve competence through submission to things that have their own intractable ways, whether the thing be a musical instrument, a garden, or the building of a bridge. It's in the encounter between the self and the brute alien otherness of the real that beautiful things become possible. For example, the, um, the puck handling finesse of the hockey player. Material things can serve as a kind of authority for us by way of structuring our attention. Now the terms authority and submission are jarring to the modern ear, and that's precisely the issue that I'm trying to tease out here. I should note that um, there's nothing crucial about physical material in this account. The important thing is rather that we're dealing with objects uh, external to the self, and other people fit that description nicely. I think any practice that brings us into cooperation with others, or in which uh, we answer to standards that are social in nature, can have this unselfing effect. And I'm borrowing this word unselfing from Iris Murdoch who I think is our best thinker about attention in her philosophical essays. I haven't read her novels, but uh, her essays are dynamite. So I want to read a little quote from her about learning a foreign language by way of an example of a, um, a non-physical practice. She says, if I'm learning, for instance, Russian, I'm confronted by an authoritative structure which commands my respect. The task is difficult and the goal is distant and perhaps never entirely attainable. My work is a progressive revelation of something which exists independently of me. Attention is rewarded by a knowledge of reality. Love of Russian leads me away from myself toward something alien to me, something which my consciousness cannot take over, swallow up, deny, or make unreal. I love how she says love of Russian. I think there is, um, that's what I'm trying to get at when I say the language of eroticism is, is, is necessary here. It's beautiful things that lead us out of ourselves. Um, consider another example, music. Um, the kind of collaborative improvisation that takes place between musicians in uh, bluegrass or jazz or classical Indian music is a good example of what I mean by an ecology of attention. It's mutually adaptive. The improvisation is possible because all parties are attending to one another. It's fruitful only because they're also steeped in forms. The history of their art has become the genetic material of their own creativity. A master jazz musician quotes from the real book with the same ease that a master preacher does from the gospels, and the illusion has gotten. It may be taken up and commented upon by the other players. It may be pushed forward toward possibilities that hadn't existed moments before, 
as they come into being only through the improvisation itself. You have to be alert and opportunistic. As in ecology, that's how new forms arise. Now note that worries about conformity versus individuality are simply put aside in this account of creativity that I've just sketched. More strongly, membership in a community is a prerequisite to creativity. What it means to learn Russian is to become part of the community of Russian speakers, without whom there would be no such thing as Russian, and likewise with jazz. These communities and aesthetic traditions provide a kind of cultural jig within which our energies get ordered. Um, to me, this sounds obvious, um, but it's at odds with the whole tradition of individualism. Descartes set out to, quote, reject example or custom in order to reform my own thoughts and to build upon a foundation which is completely my own. His point was to free his mind uh, from any taint of the kind of authority that operates in communities. And that's really a central thrust in Enlightenment thought. Hundreds of years later, Norman Mailer was still doggedly trying to secure the dignity of the self against the influence of other people. To live authentically, he said, one has to, quote, divorce oneself from society, to exist without roots, to set out on that uncharted journey into the rebellious imperatives of the self, which to me sounds like a, a kind of cartoon version of, of autonomy. Um, I, don't, I can't offer you a conclusion <laughs> um, to, to this, but just by way of stopping, I'll, I'll say a little bit more. Um, I think at this point in the history of the West, we can notice that the grand liberationist project leaves us isolated. Many inherited forms of cultural authority have been dismantled. And so each of us, as a sovereign individual, faces the problem of composing a coherent life on his or her own. Given the explosion of options presented to us ever more solicitously, this requires more self-regulation than is really very realistic for most of us, or maybe all of us. The actual effect of so much autonomy is to make, uh, is to make us more pliable, I think, to those who want to monetize our attention. We may need to reinterpret what are often taken to be sources of unfreedom in the liberal tradition and view them rather as the framing conditions for many of the most worthwhile human performances. And this would be to shift one's concern from uh, freedom to agency. And the important thing then is not to guard one's independence, but to become skilled. Thank you. Well, if you thought that was exhilarating, read the book. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, I think Matt did a, a wonderful job of trying to compress this intricate, interesting collection of, of arguments into uh, something very lucid, which helped me see the core of, uh, of what his project is, what he's uh, uh, having a go at in the book. So, uh, Chairman's privilege, I'm going to ask first a couple of, couple of questions and then uh, throw, throw it open to, uh, to, the, to the rest of you. Can I just probe the, the, uh, the, uh, the Iris Murdoch, the Russian mm. question? There seems to be, not, not, notwithstanding that, in, in your thinking, and also somewhat in mine, I think, that there actually is something important about the concreteness, the tangibleness, the the intransigence of mm -hmm. material that you're working with. And I was thinking about both you and I spend much of our time being writers, and I lose myself in that kind of Mikai type flow way of mm -hmm. lose that sense of self, become completely absorbed in a, in a world of crafting words. Is that a good case in point for you, or is when we move from 
the crafting of wood to the crafting of words is something lost, is something different in the quality of what you're trying to, trying to get hold of there? Well, I guess, um, I, guess I, th I think of my own writing kind of like representational art in that I'm trying to get something right. I, I feel myself responsible to the world and trying to capture experience. So it's not, it's not uh, you know, creative writing or whatever it's called now, I guess. Mm. Um, but actually, it is a form of crafting. I mean, you are crafting something that's difficult to do. It's, it's, I'm, I f again, I feel like there are standards outside myself that I'm trying to answer to. So in that sense, mm. I think it's like material things in that, um, well, actually, here's a difference. I think you're onto something. Um, material things tend to let you know right away when you've gotten something wrong because you get hurt <laughs> mm. uh, often as not. Mm -hmm. In writing, you can go very far down the path of, of just completely being deluded. Um, and so that's why other people are very necessary. You have, to, you have to triangulate, get other people to read your stuff. So that's where you get the feedback. It's in a social form. And those moments when you feel like you've really nailed something, mm. uh, yeah, those are, those are the best moments. We feel like, actually, like you've achieved some clarity, mm. right? Yeah. There's something about, something else I was thinking about, which is from the kind of immediacy of uh, finding something that it's worthwhile grappling with and locking onto, yeah. which then provides you with this unforced right. immunity yeah. against all the other mm. welter mm. of stuff that's going on around right. you. But there's also, I think, a, a, a strand of an argument in your book that somehow cumulatively, over time, over the longer term, that process of putting down a deep roots into what some people might call a community of practice mm -hmm. or what have you, and of beginning to know yourself, to create a sense of self, which is not this dependent upon kind mm -hmm. of free-floating preference satisfaction, right. but is actually the hard-won esteem of other people whose opinion yeah. you value. Right. And then somehow or other that translates, that regard translates into self-regard, into a sense of value, valuing or valuableness in the self. Can you, would you like to say a little I bit I should more just about? let you keep talking. No, no, it's no, no, beautiful. No, no. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah. It's, oh, um, one of the, the biggest, the most in-depth uh, case study in the book is of these people who build Baroque pipe organs. And um, one thing that was interesting about it to me is that uh, they, they've inherited this l hundreds of years long tradition of making organs, you know, back to box time. But they don't feel burdened by this inheritance. Um, they, f they seem to be energized by it. In fact, energized in innovation because they're trying to outdo those old masters and make better organs. It's like they're engaged in this, this contentious quarrel with them. But what it means is that uh, they understand their own progress in skill and understanding as part of this longer historical arc that really gives meaning to their efforts. And there is, I want to say, there's a kind of individuality that emerges mm -hmm. in this very situated setting. Uh, if by individuality we mean something like an earned independence of judgment and it's only by participating in this, um, this tradition, which is really a living tradition for them, that they're, they're both making the judgments of the tradition their own by you know, doing it for themselves and then pushing it forward into the future. And by the way, one of these guys just happened to mention offhand that the organ he was working on that day, he fully expects it to still be in service 400 years from now. That's the kind of time horizon that they're working with. And you know, these organs cost like $2 million, and they, they're, they're gorgeous. Mm. Exhilarating stuff. I've got more, many more questions, but it's time to throw it open to you and see which bits of Matt's multifaceted brain you would like to pick. Hand at the back over there. If you'd like to wait for the mics when they come around, please. Hello, hello, hello. 
Hi. Um, I am recently until recently was a teacher, I'm now a master's student and am still really committed to helping young people and I'm concerned by the amount my students are distracted with technologies. Just wondering, how do we help young people to flourish in an age of distraction? Yeah, that's really, that's tough. Um, because um, that ability to exclude all the other things grabbing at your attention is crucial to get any of this off the ground. Right? I mean, it's, once you go deep enough into something and start to get the pleasures of it, they can take on a life of their own, but it's hard to get that started when um, things that are immediately engaging are, are available to you. Mm. So um, you have more experience in the sort of world of education. Well, it's a, it's, it's a really difficult one. I mean, another question that I, that I could have asked was you, 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 you call on Simone Weil. Mm. when you're talking about, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote you from the book, grappling with a problem for which one has little aptitude or inclination, a geometry problem, say, exercises our power to attend. Yeah. And that sounds to me worryingly like a justification for a very traditional educational agenda. Would you, would you want to go there? I think uh, it should not be overly pleasing to young people. <laughs> Um, because in order to be pleasing, it has to cater to their untutored preferences. And the whole point is to lead them away from those toward having the tastes of a serious person, which are things that have to be cultivated, and it's, and it's hard. So we're, we're, we're led by the argument to a kind of Victorian model of education in which doing things that are boring and Without the whippings, is, hopefully. Right, without the Oh, without the whippings. Well. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, <laughs> whipping will be optional, perhaps. Yeah. Great. Please, another question. Is there, in fact, a link between this and uh, the apparent epidemic of attention deficit disorder? Who knows? Um, I could make something up. Um, <laughs> that's the risk of having a, a microphone attached to you. Uh, become a blowhard on every topic. But I, it does seem that there's something like a cultural attention deficit disorder. We, we tend to medicalize these things because it, it's comforting to think it's a defect in the individual yes. or brain chemistry. But my God, I mean, how could you not have a deficit of attention? So in medicalizing it, 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 um, it kind of um, thwarts our critical impulses to look at the society and what's happening. Um, but I'll, I, on the other hand, I will say that I taught high school for a year, uh, and it was a complete disaster. And I would have loved to have had a riddle and fogger in my classroom, you know, <laughs> just to, to maintain order. So I get, you know, I understand the problem. But I think what the problem is is that it's a rare person who's naturally inclined to sit still for 16 hours. I mean, for 16 years in school and then indefinitely at work, and yet this has become mm. the one-size-fits-all norm for education, mm. even as we go on about diversity in education. Yeah. But I think, I, like you, I think it's really important that we see things like ADHD, we, we see them in a, in a social and political yeah. and economic context, not just as a private trouble, but as a, <laughs> as a, as a reflection of a public issue. Yeah. Two more questions I've identified. One over there, please. Hi there, thank you very much for your work on this. I was a big fan of your previous book. Um, I w have a question about scale. So you talk about agency a lot, and um, you know, I'm interested in this process that happens when, I mean, I've been involved in aid agencies, and as organizations scale and get bigger and bigger, they become less of an age, you know, a, a mechanism for people to find their own self-expression. Mm -hmm. Perhaps when they're smaller, mm -hmm. they do identify with the causes of the organization. Yeah. But then also the, the idea that knowledge can be scaled, can be shared freely, but know-how can't. Uh, mm. Know-how can't mm -hmm. in the same way. So if, if you really want to know how to cook something, then perhaps video is, is the, the medium. So you, we ha have cookery programs and gardening programs mm -hmm. and DIY programs and, and so on. So could you t perhaps talk a little bit about... Um, maybe in, in, in relation to education, about how you think we could, the, the scale of the attention problem yeah. could be tackled. That's good. 
Yeah, I do think scale matters. And I mean, you mentioned working in a large organization as opposed to a small. It's like the chain of cause and effect can get kind of opaque and confusing. And, and that sense of individual agency can be quite elusive. Um, and then you also mentioned sort of that you can disseminate knowledge in a sort of impersonal way, but know how not so much. There's a lot of tacit knowledge that it's hard to formulate explicitly. Um, I mean, I'm uh, just personally, I've become a big user of YouTube instructional videos. Um, so in my, my business is no longer repairing motorcycles, by the way. Oh. I fabricate parts for custom motorcycles. Um, and in particular, I do something called metal shaping, which is putting compound curves in sheet metal. Anyway, um, I started off learning from YouTube. Um, there's all kinds of great you know, stuff and people demonstrating things. Uh, at some point, I had to go and get actual hands-on instruction from this real master, this Swedish guy. Um, but so yeah, it's you can scale s some things up, and other things require that. Um, almost a mentor kind of relationship. And, and that's why I think apprenticeship is, uh, is an idea we need to um, mm. embrace a little bit more. Mm. And it's another, another difference or difficulty with my trying to make an analogy with writing. Watching a YouTube, of, a, a, a video of someone else writing doesn't tell you a lot, does it? No, I guess it's by reading is what it tells you. <laughs> what you, you yeah, know. but it doesn't have the kind of face-to-face Mm -hmm. It's it's not often that you that you find a writing mentor who is someone who kind of sits over you or yeah. who you observe in practice doing something skilled that you can't yet do. Yeah, it's different. It's and it's more impersonal mm -hmm. in some way. And you know, with the move in in America is toward uh, online education, and it expresses this idea that everything can be made explicit and transmitted. Yeah. You know. From a, some centralized location to, to everybody, but you're, what's at risk, I think, is our tradition of intellectual apprenticeship in the universities, um, which does require sort of, I think, being around a teacher who has lived with the field's questions, you know, for some extended period. Um, mm. There was a question in the middle there. Yeah, please. Thank you. <coughs> Is it switched on? You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is really about the role of belief in, in all this. Mm -hmm. You might say that what the distractors are trying to do is insert beliefs into our minds. That Dunkin' Donuts is a good thing, or Costa Coffee, or whatever. And I think we know, uh, perhaps P Professor Claxton will certainly know a lot more about this than I do, that, that um, there's an asymmetry about the acquisition of belief. We're, at a very young age, we acquire beliefs. We better believe that noise in the undergrowth is a predator rather than uh, my kid brother playing around, for example. So once you've acquired beliefs, then it becomes very difficult, apparently, to get rid of them. And when you mentioned uh, the parallel to obesity, my question really is um, the equivalent of exercise and a good diet, the discarding of beliefs. We should do this before breakfast. <laughs> um. I want to suggest that you're, you're offering a Stoic line of thought, which is, um, so the Stoics think, roughly, among other things, that it, when you're being tormented by something, some unwanted emotion, say, that you can uh, free yourself from that by changing your beliefs about the irritant, whatever it is. Um, Whereas the Epicureans offer a completely different strategy. Um, they say, uh, just shift your attention to something else rather than trying to uh, mm -hmm. believe something different about the thing that's irritating you. Uh, I realize now this is not at all uh, touching on your <laughs> point, so I, I'm, I'm sorry. But it's, uh, but it's an interesting item, nonetheless, I hope. And uh, Iris Murdoch actually uh, offers what I take to be an Epicurean strategy of just, you just simply abandon the thing that's tormenting you. Mm. So um, rather than, than yeah. Mm. And so there's, I set up a quarrel between Iris Murdoch and David Foster Wallace, the novelist, who's um, more interested in um, this kind of ascetic effort to Con control his beliefs and to actually 
project generous imaginings onto other people when they're irritating him. In other words, to, to try to think himself into not hating them. You know, and this is just in situations like being in the supermarket checkout line, there's people in front of you. Um, but I, we well, have to read the book, but I find um, the Epicurean strategy more promising. Mm. Uh, but I'm sorry I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I remember, it reminds, me, it reminds me of a time that I'm not proud of when I found myself sitting next to a Tibetan Buddhist Lama at lunch, and I thought, now's my chance. So I started to tell him all about the woes of my then marriage and mm -hmm. to try and get some kind of deep advice uh -huh. uh, from him for about that. And he stopped me after a while and said, what do you enjoy doing? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I said, it kind of stopped me in the middle of my kind of self-justifying yeah. flow. Uh -huh. And I said, well, well um, we, 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 we love going for walks in the countryside. He said, do a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so I like that shit. Another question over there. Um, just as an aside, I've spent a, many years recording the interactions of wild animals in sound. And it's brought me to wonder about the, particularly from what you said today, about the definitions of both attention and distraction. Now, the tendency is to look on attention as focused attention, first and foremost, mm -hmm. and the distractions we're talking about here are, strictly speaking, scientifically in noise, they're irrelevancies. Mm -hmm. If you look at wild animals, they're exercising holistic, broad attention, unfocused attention, mm -hmm to things which are strictly relevant to them. Hmm. It's the survival requirement. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is how much the nature of the stimulus affects what you're talking about, as opposed to the mental process of the recipient, yeah. the attender. That's great. Um, so, so if I understood you rightly, um, you're saying that there I guess if you're, especially if you're the prey kind of animal, well, maybe both, you have to be broadly attentive, which is almost um, a paradox because the, the usual notion of, of attention is that mm. it's selective by its nature. You're picking out from the flux of the available the things that are pertinent to you. But yeah, what if uh, you don't know what's coming at you, but you know it's bad, and so you just have to listen for everything? That's a fascinating thought. Mm. Do you have any... Um... Uh, just, it, it reminds me of being, being in this room and listening to a talk by a man called Ian McGilchrist who has argued for a rather more subtle distinction between the two hemispheres of the brain, one of <clears> which, <throat> like the reason, he's, very crudely his argument is, the reason why we've evolved the brain that has two hemispheres is so that it's really useful to be able to do both of those things at once. Mm -hmm. Where if you just had one brain, you would have to choose the, 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 the degree of focus <clears throat> of your attention. But if you have two hemispheres, you can, you can simultaneously be trying to focus on mm -hmm. the task in hand and also monitoring more broadly. So you can, we, we evolved the trick of being both ambient and, mm. and, and focused. There's also a, a phenomenon of distributed attention in the animal world where... Um, these animals, I forget what they are, they'll, they have to stick their head down like to get the food, mm. but then they're vulnerable to attack. So they take turns like monitoring, and so collectively they, they keep mm. the wolves at bay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We, right, the hands are popping, and we've probably got time maybe for a couple more questions if they're quick. So, yes, gentlemen there. Thank you. David, I'd like to ask about your experience of, um, sorry, Matthew, uh, of being in your workshop. Um, when you're working with your hands and working with tools, are you able to completely forget about your screen work and vice versa? Because I've noticed that recently I've started flitting between the two and I've noticed that holding the two in your head at the same time is even more stressful than just doing one or the other. Yeah, I don't, I don't try. I just do, well... When I'm in the shop, uh, there's no difficulty focusing for me, unless things get frustrating, and then I get tired, and then I just want to watch TV. <laughs> um, but when it's going well, I mean, just hours pass with no, I mean, there's no self-awareness. Um, on the other hand, the writing is much harder for me. I don't, it's just, I mean, when it's going well, it's mm. dynamite, but man, it's so hard to get, get in that state. And I don't know if it's just 
you know, it's just so much e more easily disrupted. Mm. So, do you have any thoughts on that? No, no, not really. I mean, I find it easy. I can kind of, yeah. you know, sit at my desk and suddenly Re it's one o'clock and really, you know, and it was nine. Wow. So I, I, but just personally. So I think maybe there's a, you know, different strokes for different folks. Maybe. Well, you should give the how-to talk. Here. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Yes, please, the lady in the front. Could you wait for the mic? I just, um, I've got a uh, question off Twitter. Um, oh, okay. I can't pronounce one of the last words, so sorry. <laughs> um, w uh, was modern uh, distraction manufactured by today's power brokers to facilitate murky prestigitation? Whoa, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I thought about this. Translated. Yeah, yeah. Say um, it again slowly. Was modern distraction manufactured by today's power brokers, sort of in the airport power brokers. Um, power brokers. analogy um, to facilitate murky prestigitation uh, that's you? like magic right? magic yeah like, uh, yeah, oh, like yeah. Tr tricks of the mind uh, it's like could, if you, can you make any <laughs> sense of that uh, well sh um, good. i will make something up <laughs> yeah. um, so yeah so this is sort of getting at the uh, the darkly manipulative kind of idea and there's, there, there's plenty of that. I have a chapter in the book about machine gambling. Um, so it's a, it's a dark... Uh, um, mm. So there's a, there's a fantastic book on this called Addiction by Design by Natasha Dow Scholl. And um, so what the designers of gambling machines have figured out is how to accomplish a kind of behaviorist conditioning um, that establishes a gambling addiction. And they're very self-conscious in what they're doing, uh, very sophisticated on the relevant cognitive science. And um, the basic business model has apparently now been... <laughs> How mortifying. Uh, yeah. I'll just uh, talk just over it. Just stamp on it? <laughs> Just stamp on it. Yeah. I think this was actually part of the sort of performance art kind of question. This is exactly what you're talking about. I have no idea how that comes on. Right. Well, maybe it's the prestigitators or yeah. whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway, so apparently, uh, so those who develop mobile gaming apps have lately been complaining that um, that business is being taken over by the model of the gambling industry. Now, at, at first blush, that sounds implausible because you can't win a jackpot playing Candy Crush, so how is it like gambling? Uh, because isn't it the hope for a jackpot that keeps people at the slot machine? Well, no. It's, uh, the, the point is to get in the zone, which is this state of sort of quasi-autistic, repetitive absorption where the frustrations of life beyond the screen fall away. And so with the mobile gaming apps, I guess you, you have to sort of keep progressing to the next level to, to keep accelerating the rate of play, and it's that speed that is sort of calming. So um, the relevant psychology got worked out decades ago with rats. Um, but it, so there are certain corners of capitalism where these dark arts are really being honed in Vegas and in other places. And it sounds totally paranoid, but uh, this book I mentioned is a truly rigorous um, bit of anthropology, and it's, it's pretty scary. I mean, it's, it sort of represents the cutting edge of what's possible. Um, hate to end on such a gloomy note. Yeah. <laughs> um, but That's all right. We don't have to be happy. Okay. Well, there are, thanks there are for coming. Lots of people talking about flourishing and well-being and happiness. Let's uh, let's be let's be gloomy. Sorry, Ian. We're Cheers. we're we're out of time. It's two o'clock. I'm terribly sorry that you know. I think the hands were beginning to kind of buzz and ideas were beginning to percolate, but we're out of time. The chapter in the book, if you haven't read it, about the the, the way in which. The, the precision and conscious deliberateness with which this ga the gaming industry manipulates us through these kind of hyper-palatable 
stimuli. It's, it's worth the price of admission for the book just, just to read that. It is, it is truly scary. And as luck would have it, there are copies of the book on sale, I think. <laughs> Here uh, and Matthew, I, th I think, I believe, would be happy to sign them for you of course. Uh, if you want to uh, get one at the end. So, very sorry that we run out of time. Thank you very much for your questions, everybody. Please, thank you.